So I'm going to try this to just focus your attention. I'm going to say good morning. I'm going to try one more time. Good morning. OK, it didn't quite work. I think you have to be louder. One more time. Good morning. Excellent. Great. Well, and Lisa, please have a seat right here. <laughs> Well, um, on behalf of older Mainers everywhere, uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to what I hope will be the first annual Summit on Aging. Uh, and all I can say, by the way, is just wow. This is pretty darn impressive to have you all here. Uh, my name is Jess Maurer. I'm the Executive Director of the Maine Association of Area Agencies on Aging, and I am also co-chair, along with Don Harden of Catholic Charities of Maine, uh, of the Maine Council on Aging. The Maine Council on Aging is an organizational-based membership association uh, that was formed to address uh, the broader public policy issues facing older adults in Maine. We believe in a Maine that values and honors the lives and experiences of older adults and provides choices and opportunities for them to thrive in their communities. Our mission is to build a strong multidisciplinary network that represents the entire aging continuum and that works to improve the lives of older adults and to promote their safety, independence, and well-being. The Maine Council on Aging is really so very excited uh, to be co-sponsoring the main summit on, I'm sorry, the main council on aging is so very excited to be co-sponsoring uh, the main summit on aging with the speaker of the house, Mark Eves. Uh, and I'd like you to join me in thanking him for his amazing leadership and dedication to the issues of aging in Maine. Uh, this summit builds upon a series of discussions hosted by the speaker and the council this fall with members of leaders of different segments of the economy. I'm sorry, yes, of different uh, seg segments of the economy. Uh, those conversations and the ideas that were generated at the speaker's roundtable really form the ground for the discussions that we're going to have today. And before we move into that discussion, I'm actually, it's my great pleasure to offer you a welcome uh, video by Senator Susan Collins. Good morning. Welcome to the Maine Council on Aging Summit. My thanks to all of you for taking part in this very important conversation for our state and our nation. I commend the council, members of the legislature, business leaders, healthcare professionals, and all of those involved in this important conversation. As the state with the highest median age, Maine has the opportunity to set standards of excellence for the rest of the nation. As the ranking member of the Senate Special Committee on Aging, I too am focused on the concerns of our seniors and the impact of the aging population. For example, Alzheimer's is a devastating disease that takes a tremendous personal and economic toll on both the individual and the family. As the Senate co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Task Force on Alzheimer's Disease, I'm particularly committed to funding research for better treatment and ultimately a cure or means for preventing this disease. This disease has a devastating effect on 5.2 million Americans, including 37,000 right here in Maine. At a time when the cost of caring for Alzheimer's patients is $203 billion a year, which includes $142 billion in costs to Medicare and Medicaid, we are spending only slightly more than $500 million on Alzheimer's research. We currently spend, by contrast, $6 billion a year on cancer research, $3 billion a year for research on HIV AIDS, 
and two billion for cardiovascular research. All worthy investments to be sure, but certainly we should do more for Alzheimer's given the tremendous human and economic price of this illness. I've introduced a bipartisan resolution declaring that the goal of preventing and effectively treating Alzheimer's by the year 2025 is an urgent national priority. It calls on Congress to double the amount of funding the United States spends on Alzheimer's research in the year 2015 and to develop a plan to meet a target of $2 billion a year over the next five years. That's the amount that has been recommended by a panel of experts. Increasing our research investment in Alzheimer's to just 1% of the total cost of caring for people with Alzheimer's could make the real difference we need. The Aging Committee is also committed to shining a light and putting a stop to fraud and abuse scams that target our nation's seniors. We've examined ways to help seniors to become more financially secure in their retirement. And we've begun to take a look at the very complex challenges associated with long-term care, among many other important issues. My hope is that the work that we are doing through the Senate's Aging Committee in Washington will have a positive effect on public policy, not only in Washington, but also in Maine and all the states. Events such as today's summit will also go a long way in helping our state continue to move to a plan for Maine seniors that is focused on health, security, and support. Thank you all for your dedication to this important cause. So I think it's safe to say that we are really blessed to have a senator uh, in our state who is able to talk about issues like dementia, long-term care, and elder abuse, uh, and is really who is leading the way uh, to help solve some of those really important issues that are facing older Mainers. Senator Collins ended her remarks by saying that she hopes our conversation today will move us toward a plan for Maine seniors that is dedicated to improving their health, security, and community supports. It's this shared hope, I think this shared vision, that brought so many of you here today. And the Maine Council on Aging believes that if we do this work, uh, we will have stronger communities and a much stronger economy when we're done. So it's, it's my job today uh, to now walk you through the agenda very briefly so that you understand what's gonna happen. And obviously we have an awful lot of people here. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'm gonna, uh, you don't even have to look at it. I'm just gonna let you know that we're gonna be in this room until noon today with one break at 10.45. Uh, and then our lunch is actually downstairs. That was only the, way, the only way they could accommodate all of us. And they tell me that in order to feed you all in an hour, you need to be orderly. Uh, <laughs> which I know many of you, so this is not going to work. <laughs> So they actually ask you to go downstairs and start forming two lines and go, go right through the buffet. You can leave your stuff here. Nobody's going to take it. Uh, and don't go and save seats and, and you know, do different things. Just go get your food and sit down. And I think if you end up at a table with a bunch of different people you don't know, this is great. This is great. This is going to help with our conversation. Immediately after lunch, we're going to break into work sessions. And you've got on your name tag, you've got the work session you've been assigned to. Uh, and in your, on the agenda, it says what room you go to. I know many of you don't want to go to the work sessions that you've been assigned. And that's just tough. I'm sorry. <laughs> we have too many people here, which is a really awesome problem to have, right? I mean, this is fantastic that we're all here. Uh, but the work sessions actually are all full 
and there are limitations. And so we cannot afford to have 10 of you go to a different one. So please go to the one that you've been assigned to go to. Uh, at the work sessions, uh, we're going to talk more about the ideas that were generated at the speaker's roundtable. Uh, we're going to ask you to generate some additional ideas to prioritize the work that we will do in the coming months and years, uh, and to actually start us uh, off on a conversation in identifying some action steps to accomplish those goals. And I know that the speaker is going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I want you to let I want to let you know that today's uh, today's summit is just really uh, a start uh, of a conversation uh, that will be ongoing. So the Maine Council on Aging has committed to working in partnership with the speaker uh, and other legislative leaders to take the ideas that are generated today from the work sessions that are prioritized uh, to, uh, to convene work groups uh, and to help drive that work forward. Uh, in order to do that, we will create web pages on our website uh, that will uh, demonstrate who the people are in the work groups, what the plan is, and we'll um, really track their progress in meeting those goals. We're also going to create a forum for local initiatives to help them uh, share ideas and uh, to help everyone else understand what's happening in Maine that's really exciting, and you're going to hear more about things that are happening in Maine that are very exciting. So we'll be, be in touch with you. Trust me. And uh, we're going to let you know how you can help in this effort. Uh, but I just want you to know that this is a launching point. Uh, this is not a one-shot deal. Like, you come to a conference, you learn stuff, and you go away. That's, that's not what's happening here today. Uh, so we're going to be trying to keep you involved. The other thing uh, that I want to say is that uh, a lot of stuff that you hear today may feel overwhelming. We certainly heard that in the speaker's roundtable. Uh, people said, well, this is uh, overwhelming. What do you expect me to do about all of these problems? And there's certainly many, many of those of us in this room and across segments uh, of the economy who think it's too late, that we're already in a crisis, uh, and that too many older Mainers are suffering uh, because we, as a society, not anyone in particular, uh, really haven't done enough to make it safe uh, uh, for people to uh, age in their homes and in their communities. And so I just want to say we have to start where we are, and this is where we are. We have many challenges, uh, but we also have limitless possibilities. Uh, the challenges that we have are also opportunities, and we are seeing new leaders, as evidenced by many of the people in this room, uh, who are joining our conversation and who are ready to get to work. Uh, and so I would say that we are already at a tipping point and that it's a very exciting time uh, to be a part of this work. I also uh, want to say that we're clearly embarking today on something that's pretty ambitious. Uh, create a plan, uh, an action plan through a conversation with 400 people. Um, we understand that that's... <laughs> it's going to happen. I, we understand that it's an ambitious plan um, and that uh, it's also a little intimidating. So uh, on the eve of the day that we celebrate Martin Luther King's birthday, I thought that it would be useful uh, to consider something he said. Uh, he said, take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase, just the first step. The most powerful change in this country has occurred by people just taking the first step uh, and then the next. And so we're asking you today to listen well, to offer your voice, and then to go back to your communities uh, and to take the first step, whatever you think that first step might be. Uh, and so as we move forward, I just want to say before I thank the speaker and, uh, and introduce him, I need to thank some really awesome people uh, who helped us put to today together. Uh, and I, those include Evelyn DeFries, Joanne D'Arcangelo, Patty Marsh, Lynn Hanley, Pat Vampatella, Anna Hicks, Nancy Campbell, uh, the Maine Council on Aging Board, and uh, many, many people who were part of the roundtable discussion who offered their guidance and ideas in planning this program. So would you please help me in thanking those people? And I especially want to thank the John T. Gorman Foundation uh, for their support, uh, their financial support of the summit and the speaker's roundtable, uh, but also for prioritizing the needs of older adults in their funding mission. Their leadership is so exciting and is already driving real change in the area of aging, and we're quite lucky to have them as a partner. Um, and so now before I introduce the speaker, I have two uh, last things. First, I am guessing everyone in the room has a cell phone. 
And so just, you know, if you haven't, uh, oh, look, Ken doesn't. That's good. Good for you. Um, but if you have one, I have two. Um, if, you don't, if you wouldn't mind making sure that you uh, are turning that off uh, or turning it on silent and vibrate. And just, you know, like cell phone etiquette, please don't answer the phone while you're sitting at the table. People do it. I'm just saying it's just not very, it's not cool. No matter how important you are, we're all important. But please leave the room uh, before you answer the, uh, the answer to your phone. And the other piece is now I get to say that I made um, sort of a very funny, in a way, uh, and glaring error. Uh, yesterday, uh, when I was realizing we didn't uh, put together bios uh, for you all, uh, I emailed quickly Evan in my email list. Um, only it was Evan Carroll and not Evan Ricker, and and asked for a bio. And Evan Carroll was really very great and sent me his bio, and I included it. But you know, he's not talking today, and Evan Ricker is. <laughs> And if that's the worst thing that goes wrong today, we're all good, right? So um, anyway, I've apologized to Evan, and uh, the speaker has his actual bio. And um, you know, you've all met Evan Carroll. <laughs> so that's good. So now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Sp uh, Speaker Mark Eves. Uh, Representative Mark Eves was sworn in as the 101st Speaker of the Maine House of Representatives on December 5th, 2012. Speaker Eves is serving his third term in the Maine House. He has dedicated his time in the legislature and his professional career to improving the lives of children, seniors, and working families. For the past four years, Speaker Eves served on the legislature's Health and Human Services Committee, uh, and most recently as the ranking House Minority Member. In his professional life, he is a marriage and family therapist by training and served as Business Development Director for Sweetser, a statewide behavioral health care organization. He earned a master's degree in marriage and family therapy from the Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. That's a mouthful, by the way. <laughs> and a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Louisville. Mark lives in North Berwick with his wife, Laura, and their three young children. Please join me in welcoming and thanking Speaker Mark Eves. Well, good morning and, and welcome, everybody. It was inspiring to walk down the hallway, see the line around the corner, uh, and see the participation uh, this morning and throughout this day. It is incredibly encouraging and truly inspiring uh, to have the interest of so many on an issue that is so important to all of us. So I just want to take a moment and pause and say thank you. It is a full room. I think we had over 400 folks uh, Close to 500 people register. Uh, we had to put people on the waiting list. Not everybody's here that wanted to be here, and that's that's too bad. But I, I I just am really thrilled that you all are here to participate, and not this conference, but this conversation that we're going to have, and the development of a roadmap and a plan that we can take action on to really address what I think is one of the most policy imperatives facing our state. So what a great way to, to kick it off with uh, Senator Susan Collins' uh, video. Uh, she has clearly been a leader on a federal level on these aging issues, serving on the special committee that she does. Uh, we have a great congressional delegation in uh, Congressman Mishu and uh, uh, Congresswoman Pingree focusing on these issues. We, we have, uh, I think we're really special in a lot of ways here in Maine, and that is one, where we have a tripartisan uh, delegation at the federal level. Uh, as you know, uh, Senator King is going to be with us this afternoon to, to pull it all together, to wrap up. And I just think this has been one of the most encouraging things, projects that I've worked on, certainly in public life, um, certainly uh, over the last five years. It is, it is um, great to put politics aside, really figure out what is the best thing to do for our state, develop an action plan, and move forward. So um, it's just, it, it doesn't just feel good, but it's going to be good when we see the results. Um, and I do have to pause for a moment because Jess Maurer and John Hennessy came to my office probably about this time last year. And they said, hey, we have an idea. We know that there's an extreme need here. And we'd really like your help in making sure that we bring a focus on something that is so important to the state. Would you be willing to do, you know, host some, some speaker roundtables on the issue and see where it goes? So in partnership with the Maine Council on Aging, we, we did that, and, and Jess has outlined the work of that committee over, or that work group over the last, uh, over the fall, we had four sessions. Um, it, was, it was a phenomenal um, conversation where we brought together non-traditional members 
uh, of the aging community, uh, people uh, in our business community, people in our financial institutions, our universities, our community colleges, our public safety. It was really a great cross-section. We had legislators there uh, from both sides of the aisle, from both chambers, and I want to acknowledge all the legislators in this room this morning. I think for the, the non-legislators here, you should be encouraged. Uh, people are paying attention and they want to do something about it. And I just want to thank, uh, uh, in particular, my colleagues for, for taking the time out of their day to be here this morning. So before we go uh, into kind of the outline, the goals of the day, and, and, and I'm going to walk you through a few concrete examples of some really great things uh, happening in the state of Maine already, um, I want to pause and ask you a question. I really thought about whether I should do this or not, because I always hate being in the audience when somebody asks me to raise my hand. But play along, if you will. Um, so here's the question. Who here in this room truly thinks aging is an asset to our state? Fantastic. I think we can check our first goal off. Not every hand went up, but that is extremely, extremely encouraging to me. Because when we looked at the, the, um, our demographics and the problem that was presented to us, the challenge of our aging population, it's daunting. And I've come full circle in the past year through these roundtables and through discussions, and I truly believe that our aging population is not our problem. It is our opportunity, and it is an asset to the state of Maine. So thank you for being there already. And for those hands that didn't go up, maybe you were just shy. Uh, <laughs> But I hope through the conversations this morning, this afternoon, that if that question is asked again, you can say with confidence that you believe aging is an asset to our state. So the three goals for today, why are we here, what are we going to do? The first, uh, as I said, we can probably check off the list or close to it, and that is to change your mind about aging, to make sure that you understand that our aging population is an asset. The second goal is to keep the challenges and opportunities we face in the spotlight, keeping the public conversation going. Each and every one of you in this room has an opportunity to make sure that this stays on the front burner. Uh, we need to keep that public conversation going if we're really going to influence public policy in the state and whatever uh, you are doing back in your workplace or your community. We need to make sure that we keep talking about this, and that's why I'm so excited uh, Jess has outlined a little bit about we are pushing forward throughout this next year, and hopefully we can come back this time next year and talk about some of the, success, the successes that we have had and some short-term uh, gains that we have made. The third thing is formalizing the short-term and long-term goals for addressing this policy imperative, and that's where we all play a part. We are all going to participate this, in this in developing it and implementing it. So those are the three uh, concrete things that we're going to be, be doing today. And we can't achieve these goals, we cannot reach these goals if we don't work together. And we have to commit to collaborate. We just have to or it's not, we're not going to achieve our goals. So we, we, we will not succeed if we operate in our silos and the round tables for me was probably the first time that I've ever really been part of something like that, that it was truly bringing together people that generally don't talk with each other, and that's when we really get great ideas. That's when we really start to bear fruit, when we stop talking in our same circles and we talk outside and we pull together um, and, and we listen to each other and the ideas that are generated uh, from that. It has been an exciting experience to go through and, and we're just beginning. So we all, know, we all know the facts of Maine. Senator Collins uh, had mentioned we are the oldest state in the nation. That is true by median age. Uh, one in four Mainers over the next two decades are going to be 65 or older. Uh, it, is, it is something that is here and something that is going to continue to come. And we have that the statistics can be powerful, they can be overwhelming, but they're not just numbers. They have an enormous impact and implication for our economy and our state. And whether you are among the, the aging population, increasingly uh, needing health care services, or a family member who is uh, caring for a parent or an employer looking at a retiring workforce, Maine's shifting demographics 
will impact you, and that is why we are here today to do something about it. As I've mentioned already, uh, very proud of the work that, that we have begun and we will continue to do. Um, and we can only do, and we can only do and accomplish the goals if we continue to keep the, the debate at the public um, in the front burner. So I wanted to give, take a pause and give a, a shout out to the Portland Press Herald, who's done an aging series over the last year. And Kelly Bouchard has done a wonderful job in a reporting. There and she, she is, is right here, there. so she is right there. And I want to thank you personally, Kelly, <laughs> for that. I think, <laughs> I think she ran away, but I'm not sure. OK. <laughs> So she has done a fantastic job with the reporting. The Portland Press Herald and other media outlets have been a, done a fantastic job making sure that we continue to understand the true face of aging in Maine. Uh, and only a few Sundays ago, I was sitting at my uh, kitchen table drinking a cup of coffee, reading uh, the latest story, and it's a heartbreaking one, of Jim and Nancy Pike. The Pikes, uh, like many Mainers, worked all their lives. And they now live on a fixed income. And at the end of the month, they struggle to put food on the table. They uh, are living with food insecurity, and they need to go to the food pantry to make sure that they literally have food on the table and, and nourishment in their bellies. And we hear stories like the pikes from our neighbors and our friends and even our own family members. And, and, and the stories like theirs are our motivation, our parents and our grandparents are our motivation to make sure that we get this right. So how do we ensure uh, Maine parents and grandparents can age with dignity? How do we support our aging, our growing healthcare needs or support our employers who are looking at a retiring workforce and grow our economy all at the same time? And over the past few months, many of us have, have dissected that. And what we have come to is that there's no silver bullet. There's no piece of legislation that's gonna solve this. There's no one size fits all. It's a collaborative effort that we're all taking part in. So what we, what we have found and what we do need to do is take a community by community approach, one that moves our state in the right direction, one community at a time. And we already have some great examples, and I'm gonna run through four really quick concrete examples of things that are going on right here in the state of Maine, and we are starting in such a, a, a position of strength um, and the first is, is uh, the city of Saco, where they have launched an aging-friendly community incubator. I want to talk a little bit about that in a minute. The second is the University of Maine, which has launched a campus-wide initiative on aging. The third, looking at com companies like Chimbro and CMP, who are employing strategies to train older workers while attracting new ones. And the fourth concrete example I want to talk about is the collaborative effort between banks, public safety officials, and the legal community to crack down on financial exploitation of our seniors. So for, for the city of Saco, they are the first town in Maine and one of only a handful of cities nationally to launch an aging-friendly community. They are truly a vanguard for our state and for our country. The city joins communities in Oregon and New York who have already taken steps to become more age-friendly. And excite, it is very exciting because national experts and leaders are saying it could be among the first innovative models for building aging-friendly communities across the country. So people are watching Saco. So let's start with the basics. What does it mean to be an aging-friendly community? It means actively planning and preparing to accommodate an aging population. In the aging-friendly community models, we see some common threads. Accessibility to transportation options, accessibility to a wide range of housing options, accessibility to social participation, respect, and social inclusion, accessibility to civic participation and employment, communication and information sharing, and accessibility to community support and health services. And as we listen to that list, what is really amazing about that, I think, is that those are the exact same things that appeal to young folks. Families like myself who have young children, mother, a mother and father pushing a stroller on the sidewalk have this, want the same conveniences as seniors. And like seniors living on fixed incomes, young people just starting out in their careers need low property taxes and rent. 
And there is an extremely important nexus here between both ad adjusting to our aging demographic and attracting new people. And I think it's this synergy that we're going to find a lot of solutions. So why Saco? It's really a, a microcosm of Maine. The median age of the community is 42. 13% uh, of their population is 65 or older. And this was really interesting, because you always want to find people's motivations. And we all have, all have different ones with different levels of priority. But for, in the Saco uh, area, the development director, Peter Morelli, said his push to, to look at aging issues was prompted in part by the economic implications of the city and for the city. And in his community, Atlantic Heights, a development uh, for seniors, is the largest single taxpayer in the city and among the top five employers in the city. So it's the perfect place to start this community by community approach to aging. Maine could become a national model if we in this very room harness the grassroots efforts that are required, like the ones happening in Saco. So in short, we need to scale up what Saco is doing. And I believe one of the goals of this group should be at looking at establishing more aging-friendly communities in our state. So this, that, that was the first concrete example. The second concrete example is the University of Maine. The University of Maine has launched an aging innovative uh, in initiative across their campus that will really work towards uh, solving uh, this policy imperative. There are several things that I'll outline, the things that they're focused on. Alternative models of transportation and a mobility enhancement designs for safer and more maneuverable and accessible living spaces, technology for maximizing communication, slowing memory, and reducing social isolation, new uh, conceptions of leadership and mentorship and volunteering, civic engagement, and, art, and the arts and humanities, and alternative modes of teaching and learning to maintain the creative process over the lifespan. So they are in the deep end of the pool, and they started this uh, because they believed in it. And they have been inspired, and we have uh, continued to inspire one another uh, by what's going on there and the focus that we are bringing. And I just wanted to thank uh, Carol Kim, uh, the, the Vice President of Research, for coming to all of the, the, uh, the, the roundtables to talk about what the university is doing and how excited they are moving forward. So we have a, a, another great example in the University of Maine and what they're doing. The third example relates to our business community and talking about the challenges of a retiring workforce. So looking at companies like Chimbro, and we're going to hear from Mr. Vigu later this morning about what they are doing uh, with the retiring and aging workforce. Um, met with Sarah Burns, the CMP CEO, and 10 in 10 years, 50% of their workforce could retire. And for them, obviously, that's an alarming number. And she said, you can share that number if you tell the other half of the story. So I will. And they're not sitting on their hands. They're doing something about it. They're looking at uh, their current workforce, what they need, and they're really making that connection and continuing to make that connection with the community college system, assessing their needs, working with the community colleges and the universities to develop the training programs that they will need to make sure that their workers are there. So I'm not going to steal any thunder from, from Mr. Vigu here. Uh, you will hear more about what Chimbro is doing, very proud of what they are doing, how they value their workers and their, the experience uh, of their older workers. It is, it is quite remarkable. So that, that's the third concrete example of what's going on in Maine. The fourth and final one, the partnerships that are happening to combat elder financial exploitation and abuse. And the, Mount, and the Maine Council for elder abuse prevention has been focused on this and they've been doing some really outstanding work. And they believe elder abuse is a community problem with a community solution. They're working with bankers and sheriffs and lawyers to protect Maine seniors from all forms of abuse. So it is exciting to have these four examples. There are many more, but we have limited time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep it to those and, and just say that we have an amazing opportunity. We really do. And I want to remind folks of what, of what uh, Jess had said, and that this is just the beginning. We are on a journey together. This past fall was the very beginning, and you are part of this experience to make sure, again, that we address this policy imperative, we do something meaningful for the people of Maine, we prepare for our future, and we put our economy in a better place. 
So again, I want to just absolutely thank you. It is a thrill. You inspire me by being here. We will continue to keep pushing. I'm, I'm really interested to see what comes out of this morning and the work groups afterwards, but it is just, it's amazing. And, and I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to be here this morning.